Huge regains radio license after 27 years. Woman despairs with her nine-year-old daughter. Husband pleads for a safe return. Man confesses to Freeman Street robbery murder. And football goes both crushes a six-year-old boy. Those were the top headlines for the week ending September 29. I'm Sandy Ramutar. Good afternoon. Starting things off on News Update's Weekend Review, we tell you three persons have been arrested following the fatal shooting of a barbarian on Sunday morning. Two other family members have been injured during the ordeal. Find out more in this Nikhil John, the report. My brothers were there putting some chocolate in, in, in this, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, what, what I discovered is that when these people attack you, they do it with a, 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 a big surprise. The shooting and robbery took place in the wee hours of Sunday morning at Freeman Street East La Penitence. Brother of the deceased, Raymond Shahid, during an interview said, after he returned home at his Sabrianville residence, his sister called to inform him that there was a shooting. The man added that he was retiring to bed when he received the call. However, he immediately drove down to his sister's residence. I inquired as to where they gone and they indicated to me that they were the PhD. So I drove down there, I, I went into the triage room, I saw my brother, right, um, Fazal, who was already dead. I saw my, my next brother, um, Talim, who was shot and the, the bullet came from his shoulder and exited here. And my other brother, um, <coughs> um, Shalim, right? Um, he had bullet holes, about two or three bullet holes in his, in, in his tummy, and he was considered to be um, a, was very, a very serious. Um, the doctors tried their best. Shahid stated that the family was preparing for their father's one year death anniversary when the tragic incident occurred. He claimed that his siblings were born and raised in the area and there has been no recent memory of such a tragedy to the family. What has transpired this morning at about one o'clock, uh, it's, it's beyond my comprehension. And my question is, I, I ask rhetorically, where are we going as a country? People are not going to invest here. And also, I must say that we, my sister tried calling 911 and that was a no-go. That, that was a no-go. The dead man's mother spoke to the media while in tears. Oh, I'm going to talk, I don't know what to say. Oh, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. Now something will run. Oh, I don't know what to say. Come to the part of that little memorial today. Today, I'm going to leave walk this service. Oh, God. The Divisional Commander Marlon Chapman said, based on initial investigation, the bandits carted off with jewelry before opening fire on the family members. Three brothers were shot. One died, two still in hospital. Um, so far there is one arrest as far as my brief goes. And the ranks are doing some work with the hope of arresting some other persons. Meanwhile, the police have arrested three suspects in relation to the tragedy. The police say the trio is cooperating with investigators. Nikhil Jonder reporting for MTV News Update. On a brighter note, after 40 long years, Guyana's rice is returning to Cuba. Nine Prasadant Company Limited today sailed 7,500 tons of rice to Cuba, costing over U.S. $3.5 million. Following an extended gap in exporting to the Cuban market, the first shipment of rice worth over U.S. $3.5 million left Guyana's shores on Monday, September 25. A representative from All Import was present to witness the shipment of the rice by Nan Prasad and Company Limited. He is here just to observe what is happening on the first shipment. And um, he did say that he's confident with the Ghana Rice Development Board doing the quality. He has been here through the entire time of loading. We started to load on Friday. And this rice is in the final stages of loading and it will be leaving sometime during today. It takes about five to six days to arrive in Cuba and then it will be offloaded there. The first shipment of rice amounts to 7,500 tons. Another shipment is expected to leave shortly as part of the 15,000 tons of rice deal for September and October. Nan Prasad will continue to supply rice to Cuba in 2018 as the company prepares to draft an investment proposal. 
This follows an agreement between the two companies to establish a rice milling plant and warehouse in Cuba. General Manager of the Guiana Rice Development Board Acting, Alison Peters, said rice has seen an increase across all regions. According to her, rice millers have been paying paddy farmers in excess of $3,000 per bag of paddy. In all regions we have started to harvest paddy and um, there has been an increase in most of the prices, even in Essequibo, uh, where the prices normally are lower than other regions. We have had prices that has gone above $3,000 per bag at uh, this time and um, so the prices have indeed increased during this crop. In addition to the 22 rice markets that Guyana have, the government will continue to look forward for more lucrative markets for farmers to have more for their produce. Paddy production for the first crop of 2017 was recorded at 518,677 tons. There is no need for any parliamentary debate on the Commission of Inquiry report into the once thriving Guyana Sugar Corporation as it is costing the government billions. This is assertion of Minister of Agriculture Noel Holder following the $2 billion bailout given to Guy Sucre last week. Here's the Sean Combs, Cornelia. Minister of Agriculture Noel Holder, during a telephone interview with News Update, stressed while the Guyana Sugar Corporation Guy Suku is in its diversification stage, only one estate has been permanently closed by the coalition government, the LBI Sugar Estate. When asked whether there should be a parliamentary debate on the report of the Commission of Inquiry into the state of Gaisuko, Minister Holder affirmed that doing so would only cost the government more that can be used for other substantial initiatives. You know what is costing us every year to keep the industry alive, just like that? It's costing $15 billion a year. And that is money that can be better spent to increase civil servant salaries, teachers' salaries, a better police force, invest more in education, invest more in roads and development, because that's money down the drain. We can keep on debating this for the next 10, 15 years. We've had all the opportunities to debate it. It's been debated at the Public Accounts Committee, and Kaisuko has come before the committee, and the Commissioner of Inquiry have come before the committee. This thing has been debated. How much more debate do we need? On September 22, Minister of State Joseph Harmon disclosed that government had approved a $2 billion bailout for the corporation as Guy Suku was once again without cash. In return, Guy Suku gave up ownership of some of its lands to the Central Housing and Planning Authority. Nonetheless, Minister Holder remains adamant that the government is doing what is best for the once prolific sugar industry. A state paper has been stated in Parliament, which after all these debates and considerations, this is what the government came up with. And that's what we're acting on. Mm. The debate that continue debating it is not going to be useful, okay. in our opinion. Reporting for MTV News Update, Deshauna Gomes, Cornelius. The scrap metal industry, which was closed by the government in 2015, is yet to be reopened. However, Minister of Business says the new legislation has already been drafted to establish a unit to govern the trade. The Shanagom's Cornelius tells us more. According to Minister of Business Dominic Gaskin, all plans by government to reopen the scrap metal trade have been delayed. When questioned about the reasons behind the delay and of government's efforts to restructure the scrap metal unit to help monitor the trade, this was the minister's response. Yeah, we, we haven't made any, taken any decision on that. In fact, um, we had reopened the trade for a three-month period to allow exporters and dealers to clear their yards and get rid of, you know, accumulated scrap metal. Um, you know, it is, we, we have to take into consideration that budget will take up a lot of time during the latter part of this year, a lot of the Assembly's business uh, during the latter part of this year, so that if it is not um, done before then, it will have to go for the next year. It is through the legislation that the, um, that the unit will be formally established and given the authorization to, to regulate the 
the, the, the trade in scrap metal. Further, Minister Gaskin clarified, while there was a three-month grace period for the scrap metal trade earlier this year, there has still not been a thorough evaluation of what took place during that period. Having a more regularized unit in place to govern the scrap metal industry will prove beneficial, the minister said. Uh, we still haven't done a proper full evaluation of what took place during that period um, because there were extensions granted um, to some on some of the licenses that were issued during that period um, so the it actually extended beyond the three month period also to to to, to complete contracts, some of them had um, pending contracts with um, large companies. Following the coalition party's assumption to office in 2015, the scrap metal industry was closed to facilitate an audit. The audit done by Ram and McRae found that the functions of the scrap metal unit was not set out in any legislation. Further, during that period of operation of the unit, there was one instance when manhole covers belonging to GWI were found at a dealer on the east bank of Demerara. The legislation is yet to be presented in Parliament to have the trade reopened. Reporting for MTV News Update, Lashona Gomes, Crinelius. One of the surviving brothers who was shot during Sunday morning's robbery has undergone reconstructive surgery. Thus far, one of the bandits has confessed to the crime. Find out more on this, Nikhil John do report. One of the three suspects has confessed to investigators of his involvement in the robbery in which Fazal Shahid was fatally shot. The two other suspects are said to be cooperating with the police. The Shahid's family was robbed on Sunday morning. During the early morning robbery, three brothers were shot. One was pronounced dead on arrival at the Georgetown Public Hospital. The other two have been admitted at the hospital. Brother of the deceased, Raymond Shahid, during an interview said his two brothers remain patients at the medical facility. He noted that his brother, who was shot to his abdomen, underwent reconstructive surgery to his intestine. The family was preparing to observe their father's one-year death anniversary on Sunday. However, several hours before that observance, bandits stormed the family's Freeman Street residence and demanded cash and jewelry. It was during that confrontation the three brothers were shot. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. After being devastated by fires that got to their homes, all have not been lost for six families. Each family was given household packages worth $40,000 by the Guyana Relief Council. The six families were presented with a package each containing clothing, utensils, groceries and linens worth $40,000. This is according to Administrative Officer of the Guyana Relief Council, Lynette Carter. Carter stated that the donation is part of their mission to respond to the many calls for support following tragedies. The Guyana Relief Council, with its limited financial and human resources, is making a valiant effort in responding to the many calls for assistance occasioned by the recent occurrences of several fires affecting families throughout Guyana. Today, the Council is presenting donations to six families whose homes were destroyed by fires. The GRC to date has supported 54 families comprising of 71 persons who lost their homes as a result of fires. The victims who were in dire need of the support lauded the organization for their timely contribution. I would like to say thank you to everybody. I was in the fire in North of Fire. And thank you for everybody that is helping us. I want to see. I'm the victim from the um, school teacher that like to find the house with inside. And I want to say thanks very much for the Guyana Relief Council and all you folks. And when time of need, helping me. And I want to say thanks very much. And may God bless the hand that gave it. And I'm happy about it. I would like to say special thanks to the Guyana Relief Council for their support. Yes, I lost everything. I really appreciate the kindness. 
Additionally, support was given to a family whose house suffered damages from heavy winds and another family from a welfare organization. On the other hand, 14 persons from welfare families were also assisted by the council. Carter also urged the public to support their humanitarian mission by making contributions. The young lad, who was heartlessly sodomized and subsequently killed, has been laid to rest today. His decomposing remains were found after one of the two men confessed to the heinous crime. Find out more in this report. The body of 12-year-old Leonard Archibald was transported to his residence at Sisters Village, East Bank, Burbies. At the lad's home, scores of people turned out to get a final glimpse of Archibald as he lay in his casket. The lad went missing on September 17 after he went with his bicycle to pick up his sisters from a birthday party. That party was only a village away from his home. Police say the main suspect, Hillary Edwards, has confessed to the brutal murder. According to the police, Edwards led investigators to where the child's bicycle was discarded. Archibald's decomposed body was later discovered on Sunday. Edwards have since implicated another individual after confessing to investigators. Both men are in police custody. Acting Crime Chief Paul Williams said the men will be charged for the brutal murder before the end of the week. Nikhil Jonder reporting for MTV News Update. Gruesome indeed. In what was expected to be an exciting day for a young lad turned out tragic. The six-year-old boy was killed today after a goalpost fell on him at the Pleasance Industry Community Center ground during a school sports practice session. Find out more in this Nikhil John Do report. Dead is six-year-old Glenshon Skeet of Graham Street, Pleasance, East Coast, Demerara. Father of the deceased, Glenroy Skeet says he was at work when he received the call to go to the Georgetown Public Hospital. Then I go after, but I didn't get to see him up to now. But instead, said some goal post at the school. Far along, I know the children like them are swinging on the goal post and the goal post far along on the and down there. The father says the child is his only son while recalling his last encounter this morning. I really love him, but up to this morning, he only pick up dung when he can. He said, Daddy, you actually bring a dung to you. Some of me want no dung now, but I'll take it from you later. He always joyful, he always make you happy. You know, he always there, there by my side and things. I love him, I want to know this son. Real good child. He bad and so on, but he good to me, boy. He was real good. Mother of the deceased, Stacy, said she took her child to school this morning. The woman said she told the teacher not to take her child to the school sports. However, that order was not followed. It is reported that a teacher from St. Paul's Primary took a group of students to the community center to have practice sessions just before the start of their school sports. While at the venue, the teacher told the students not to venture out to the goalpost, which was some distance away. Carry out a few there, to let it run down the road a little bit. You know what I mean? Normal road they always do, but about four or five of them got car the goalpost was standing. Which is wrong how the goalpost is standing here. Yeah. Because the, the fellas that was playing football and thing, they got the goalpost from there. If you could see the goalpost in the car, the next one, the tilts up. And I see the flak of them trying to flak around the little bike, but I don't know what going on. So I count, I said, well, I really am there. So one and two and two and two and three. The little bike dead. The bike dead. So I said, nah, man. I take it like joke also. The lad was rushed to the Georgetown Public Hospital where he was pronounced dead on arrival. His mother, who is nine months pregnant, was inconsolable as the news broke of his death. Chief Education Officer Marcel Hudson was at the hospital along with teachers from the school and welfare department. However, the official was reluctant to speak to the media. 
Skeet leaves to mourn his mother, father and seven other siblings. Nikhail Jondo reporting for MTV News Update. A Parfit Harmony man is pleading with his wife to return home. The man, Hans Snowhart, claims his wife, who mothers their three children, disappeared with the couple's nine-year-old daughter on August 31. The Shawna Gomes Cornelius filed this report. According to the husband of Amrita Rambisun, Hans Nohar, also known as Kishan, his wife Rambisun along with her nine-year-old daughter went missing without a trace late last month. Nohar of Lot 1776 Parfait Harmony lamented to News of Day that he is quite worried about the welfare of both his wife and their daughter. The distraught man explained that on the day his wife disappeared, himself and Rambisun were involved in an argument over her mingling with a neighbor. Nohar claimed that Rambisun was quite upset by his demand for her to not mix with a male neighbor. The man further claimed upon his wife and daughter's disappearance, he made contact with the woman's family, but no one knew of their whereabouts. Um, I, I take a little drink and my opposite neighbor and I had a little situation by accident argument. And um, from there, my wife and I end up, um, in this, she ended up in this situation too with the argument. And, and the, I went to work the next morning I went to work and I come home in the afternoon. She was not at home with, also with my nine-year-old daughter. She's not at home. From there, I start go aware about her family, and they say that she she was there, but they, she, they don't know um, where she's staying. She's go at East Coast by her sister, right? And um, I thought she was there, but she she's not there. They say she visit, but um, she take her from there. This is the second time she, she go away, but the last time she go, she was at East Coast by her sister. Spent nine months, right? Uh -huh. And she came back home. We were living good, but the neighbor and I, they always minding the, the business, you know, and um, she take off with them. Subsequently, Noha reported the matter to the Lagrange police station. I still keep contact with the family and so. I went to the station and make a report at Lagrange police station and also to the welfare officer concerning my nine-year-old daughter and my wife. Well, I make contact with phone calls, and they say no, they don't know where Anita is, right? I'm very worried about Anita and my, um, my daughter because the next two that I have, Joshua and uh, Rebecca, they, they are very worried too. In the meantime, Nohar says he will continue to search for his wife and young daughter and encourages members of the public to make contact with him on telephone number 6826536 or the nearest police station. Reporting for MTV News Update, Lashona Gomes, Cornelius. The two men who were accused of brutally murdering the Barbie scene last Sunday have been charged separately. Young Leonard Archibald was sodomized and subsequently killed. Everybody, this boy get me here innocently. You understand? And I will prove it. I will prove it before the court. Goodbye. Don't stop. Don't stop. 29 year old Hillary Edwards and 19 year old Obadiah Nicholas Christopher were charged separately with the teen's murder. The two men appeared before Magistrate Alex Moore. The matter was called at the New Amsterdam Magistrate's Court. Both murder accused were remanded and will return to court on December 8, 2017. It is alleged that between September 17 and 23 at Sisters Village, they murdered Leonard Archibald. According to reports, the teen took his bicycle and was heading to a nearby village to pick up his two sisters from a birthday party. His body was found days later, partially decomposed. Archibald was laid to rest on Tuesday as hundreds turned out to say farewell. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. The University of Guyana has been granted their radio broadcasting license after 27 years. This will give students from the Center for Communication Studies hands-on experience of broadcast journalism. Yanis Abrams tells us more. The University of Ghana was this afternoon pleased to announce that the Center for Communication Studies has been relicensed after 27 years. 
Minister of Public Telecommunication Catherine Hughes says she is pleased that the university's 15-mile radius frequency license has been granted. The proposed name Golden Hour Community Broadcasting System has been on the front burner for the ministry, according to Hughes. Our government has always held the view that there's no reason why the University of Guyana should have a communication studies department without that very important training tool, a radio station of its own. It will provide the important opportunity to transfer theoretical knowledge into practical, what we would call on-the-job training. Deputy Vice Chancellor for Philanthropy, Alumni and Civic Engagement, Professor Paloma Mohammed, mentioned that for some time, students of the Center for Communication Studies have been complaining of not having practical training and hands-on experience in the journalism field. Part of the problem was rectified when we had that big engagement with Ohio University, UNESCO, and HED through USAID in providing the studio equipment for us to be able to train people on how to produce. But as media people, you know that live on, la on, on, on air training is a creature in itself. Minister, you were a news anchor, you, you know this. So that's a big gap that we had. We couldn't train anybody. And part of the, the, the big gap that this is going to fill is that we're going to be able to, one, train people to do live on air broadcasting in both radio and television. The second thing is it's going to create a forum for our student-led and faculty-led productions. The University of Guyana's program for journalism and communication was established 30 years ago. The university was denied renewal of their radio broadcasting license in 1990 and had been trying to be relicensed ever since. The radio station is scheduled to start broadcasting in April 2018 and will cost the university 79,000 U.S. dollars. Reporting for MTV's News Update, I am Yanis Abrams. In an effort to create a robust economy, a national effort is needed. This can be achieved by increasing consumption of locally produced goods. Here's more. Minister of Business Dominic Gaskin said majority of the investors are local but provide employment alike as those that are foreign. Noting that it takes a vast amount of investment to kickstart an economy, Gaskin said a transformation structure is necessary. This can be achieved through a national effort by increasing consumption of locally produced goods. For every um, item that we consume that is produced locally, we are creating the jobs over here that go into the production of that item. When we um, import items that are, uh, are produced in other countries, then the jobs created are in those other countries. Gaskin said consumption of local produce will aid in stimulating local businesses to venture into production. He also underscored a recent development of a $4.4 million investment in the Lisa One oil well, which was greenlighted by the government a few months ago. Earlier this year, a five-year strategic action plan was created by the ministry in an effort to improve the quality of local products and services to achieve greater competitiveness in the global market. The Ghana National Broadcast Authority says they are persons broadcasting without ever being granted a license to do so. This practice must end, says Board Chairman Leslie Sobers, who affirmed that they will be thrown off the air. Yannis Abrams with the details. The Board Chairman of the Ghana National Broadcast Authority, GNB, Leslie Sobers, during an exclusive interview with News Update, said that the authority has received approximately 58 applications for broadcasting license. Sobers mentioned that the 50th applicants does not include the existing broadcasters. He further added that there are some existing broadcasters who are not licensed or are never licensed to broadcast. We have asked them to ensure that they are in the list of those who will be applying uh, to be properly licensed. So a fair number, I think I can be fairly accurate by saying about 58. The chairman stated that Licenses have not been granted to any applicants except to the University of Guyana. Soberus additionally said that broadcasters need to bring themselves up to the standards of 2016. Uh, not as yet, because broadcasters have to bring themselves up 
to date, as of 2016, before we issue any other licenses. So when we are ready to relicense those who are not compliant, as at the end of 2016, will not be licensed and will be asked to come up the year. On July 27, the Broadcast Amendment Bill 2017 was laid in the National Assembly. The government was brought under scrutiny by the opposition party and broadcasters for the clauses in the bill. The bill which was passed in the House requires all broadcasters to provide up to one hour per day to government to broadcast public service announcements. This was one of the clauses that stakeholders have a grouse with. Reporting for MTV's News Update, I am Yanis Abrams. A former employee of a Brazilian mining company has been implicated in the brutal murder of the company's owner. This was confirmed by acting top cop David Ramnerine. Find it more in this report. Acting Commissioner of Police David Ramnerine said the Brazilian miner who was shot and killed in Aquana, Cayuni Region 7 on Wednesday was licensed to carry a shotgun and a .32. According to Ramnerine, both firearms are missing. Ramnerine said the Brazilian miner was the only person licensed to carry a firearm. It appears as though there was um, a possible involvement of a former employee of the deceased. With regards to the security of the mining concessionaire, Ramnerine said he cannot confirm what sort of security was provided to the mining operation. The acting top cop said over 100 persons are employed with the company, which has a large mining operation. The closest mining operation is Aurora Gold Mining in Region 7. Being an expansive one with some 15 dredges and two what we call crusher plants, it is probably safe to assume, not unreasonable to assume, that he would have had some level of his own security. Right? But um, as of to the extent type of security, I am not privy to that information at this time. Minister of Public Security Kamaraj Ramjitan said the Ghana police force continues to have challenges to access these back dams. He noted that the perpetrators had plenty of time to carry out their illegal activity before the police could have arrived. Minister Ramjitan alluded to the fact that the force is limited in resources. We really can't put policemen in all the mining concessions. It will be a, a, a challenge for us, but we are trying. We are doing as best as is possible and um, we understand uh, from the ongoing investigation that a couple of things have been discovered. It could very well be that they are Brazilians. Initial reports had indicated that several persons were shot during the heinous act. However, investigators have thus far ascertained that only the Brazilian miner was shot while a few workers sustained minor scrapes and cuts when they fled the camp. The police also said the marauders were all speaking Portuguese. A team of investigators has been dispatched from police headquarters who are still in the mining area. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. That's a wrap for MTV's News Updates Weekend Review. The newscast can be viewed online on our MTV's Facebook page and also on our YouTube channel. Join us Monday, October 2 at 7 hours 30 for another edition of MTV's News Update. On behalf of our news team, I'm Sandy Ramutar. Thank you for watching.